AMD's Vega 56 launched too late to capture much market share from Nvidia's GTX 1070. And while AMD fans typically expect Radeons to get better with age, any chance they had of picking up a second wind were dashed by the curse that would follow Vega for years. As it turns out, they're uncommonly good at crypto mining. As I write this, the crypto markets aren't doing so well, and it appears that some of the less confident miners have sold off a bunch of their GPU inventory for what are pretty rational prices. After years of being unable to recommend the Vega 56 for gaming, it might actually be time to change my tune. I don't usually overclock GPUs in my videos. I know some people would rather I did, but my rationalization is that if you can get an old graphics card to run faster with an overclock, good for you. The thing is, it's not always safe to assume that older cards can still run at the clocks and temps that they used to. I've made an exception in this case. AMD's Vega cards have some passionate aficionados, and if you don't run your Vega 56 and 64s undervolted and overclocked, they hold your family hostage. Still, I want this video to cater to those who don't feel confident tweaking settings or who struck whatever the opposite of gold is in the silicon lottery. <laughs> How's that for a mixed metaphor? So, in benchmarking my Sapphire Pulse Vega 56, I've run a couple of the tests twice, once with a hefty undervolt, increased power limits and tweaked clock speeds, and then again at stock settings. The biggest difference between the two configs is the HBM2 VRAM, which runs at 800MHz stock, but which I've overclocked to 920MHz. While I was at it, I also set a custom fan profile. The stock ones seem to have been tuned to run the core at about body temperature, and this cooler does not have particularly quiet fans. My test platform is the moderately priced gaming PC, rocking a 6-core Ryzen 5 5600G clocked to 4.6GHz with 16GB of DDR4-3600 on a B450 Tomahawk Max 2 motherboard. It seems fair to compare the Vega 56 to the results I saw from the GTX 1070, as the former was AMD's answer to the latter, and in God of War we're seeing a substantial win for Vega. At 1080 original with maxed shadows and textures, the 56 scores over 10% higher than the 1070, with averages scraping under 80 FPS and minimums at around 70. Pushing to high, again with max textures and shadows, the margin is similar or even slightly higher, averaging 68 and only barely dropping below 60 in gameplay. Out of curiosity, I tried to run at 1440 and it managed a 60 FPS average, but lows dropped into the 50s. One thing that doesn't go in AMD's favour here is the occasional loading stutters, which I've seen on multiple tiers and generations of Radeons now. I haven't really isolated exactly why, but Final Fantasy VII Remake still selectively enforces a frame rate limit of 60 FPS, even when I have a 120 FPS limit selected. I can't put my finger on the cause, but the R9 290, RX 480, GTX 970 and some others all run at above 60 FPS. Running through my test area, or even through the quite demanding cutscene beforehand, the Vega 56 barely raises a sweat at 1080 high, never needing to wind up its clock speeds and staying incredibly cool. In fact, even 1440 isn't fully utilising the card, and both resolutions manage a solid 60 FPS. I'd probably recommend even owners of 1080 monitors run FF7 at 1440, as fine details around hair and textures look better downsampled from 1440 to 1080. As for any higher, well, the section I benchmark in saw another reasonably stable 60fps even at 4K, though with more frame time spikes than at lower settings. The cutscene saw even more sustained drops, so unless you really want to play in 4K, you might consider 1440 the safer option. Elden Ring is another game that labours under a frame rate cap, but that doesn't mean we can't tell anything about its performance. At 1080 max settings, the Vega 56 only dips as far as 50 FPS, spending much of the rest of the time at or around the cap, and those drops are most likely down to shader compilation. That being said, the GPU usage remains pretty high, so there's not a huge amount of performance being left on the table. Pushing up from 1080 to 1440 does in fact see the game drop to a 52 FPS average, with lows in the mid 40s. 4K might be possible here, with some settings compromises, 
but I probably wouldn't advise prospective Vega 56 buyers to pick one up with that in mind. Although Elden Ring replaced Guardians of the Galaxy on my benchmark suite after a series of unreliable results from the Marvel game, I did feel the need to grab a couple of quick benchmark runs just for comparison to the GTX 1070. At 1080 high, the game saw over 100 FPS on average and only lost a couple of frames stepping up to Ultra. Although this isn't very representative of gameplay, it's at least something to refer to. It also happens to be about 25 FPS faster than the GTX 1070 at the same settings. That's about a 30% increase and is pretty freaking incredible. The margin in Forza Horizon 5 is less impressive, but still substantial. The Vega 56 completes the built-in benchmark with about 100 FPS at 1080 High and 70 FPS at 1080 Ultra. This is compared to about 90 and 60 FPS on the GTX 1070. The Vega 56, overclocked and undervolted as it is, could actually give a smooth experience at 1440. At high settings, the benchmark recorded 82 FPS, and while I didn't do an official benchmark at 1440 Ultra, I did record FPS in a race on the same track, and saw a 60 FPS average with drops into the 40s. So far, I've yet to find GPUs that run Halo Infinite in proportion to the actual quality of its graphics. Old flagships and modern budget cards alike mostly have to run the game at low settings to get decent competitive frame rates. The Vega 56 isn't a huge change from that. The game was still designed with RDNA, Turing and Ampere in mind, and isn't optimised for GCN5 at all. Nevertheless, it appears the Vega card has the raw power to brute force a solution. At 1080 low, the overclock card manages 83 FPS in my single player outdoor test scene, dipping a little below 60 at minimum. This is actually the highest result I've seen so far, about 15 FPS faster than the RX 6500 XT and without the horrific LOD issues that card suffered from. In fact, I was so impressed I thought I'd have a go at the high quality preset. And while 54 FPS isn't unplayable by any stretch, it's definitely more for people playing through the campaign rather than those looking to play large scale multiplayer maps. In Cyberpunk, the Vega 56 once more leads the pack by a substantial margin. At 1080 medium, this means 76 FPS on average and 55 FPS 1% lows. Pushing the quality preset up to high can still maintain a 60 FPS average, with drops only as far as the 40s. This is fairly acceptable in my opinion, though a judicious application of FSR, especially FSR2 if you use the mod from Nexus Mods, could help bring that minimum up without compromising quality too much. Another absolutely enormous delta between the Vega 56 and GTX 1070, this time in Rainbow Six Extraction. The 1080 high benchmark run scores 145 FPS with lows of 102, making this a perfect match for an entry level high refresh monitor, and also making it about 30% faster than the GTX 1070. Pushing up to very high cuts the average by about 10% if for some reason you feel you need the extra bit of visual flair. So it seems that Splitgate has a 360 FPS limit, and honestly I didn't expect to meet it this year without compromising on quality. Well, the Vega 56 has set out to prove me wrong, and although averages across the three test matches didn't come close to the cap, they did pass the 300 FPS mark frequently, and the maximum frame rate indeed reached 360. I didn't test at higher resolutions, but I dare say you could still get a high refresh experience at 1440, maybe even 4K? Vanguard was another unrivaled success, beating the next best cards, the RX 6500 XT and GTX 1070, by about 30%. At 1080 medium, with maxed out textures and shadow maps, it's sauntering into the realms of the high refresh displays, averaging 129 FPS across four matches. 
I didn't get around to testing low or indeed high, but there's plenty of room here to experiment with finding your own ideal settings. Fortnite's performance is also the best I've seen in a GPU archive video this year. Last year's numbers don't really count as I was using a quad-core Zen 2 chip that couldn't push far past 200 FPS. Once more however, the CPU is struggling to keep up as the Vega 56 approaches the high 200s and low 300s, settling for an average FPS of 266. Paired with a 12th gen i5 or a next gen Ryzen, I can see room for at least a 290 FPS average at Pro settings, maybe even higher, but that's in DX12, not even in performance mode. At high settings, with epic view distance however, you'll have to settle for a more pedestrian 132 FPS. Um, during initial testing, I realised that I haven't been disabling the 144 FPS cap in Apex Legends since I last reinstalled it, so... Um, Oops on my part for that, but it turns out not to have been the end of the world. The Vega 56 can push maximum frames of 170 or higher, but the average is a still excellent 130 FPS at 1080 high settings. Be sure to disable the cap in the launch options if you plan dropping quality further, however. Aside from my having a pretty shitty day gameplay-wise, my Warzone experience with the Vega 56 was pretty good. This is the first time I've had a GPU earn over 100 FPS in this game, which was at 1080 normal with textures and shadows maxed out. The next nearest results I've seen were the RX 6500 XT tested on a PCIe 4 build with an i5-11400. With all the overclocked and undervolted testing out of the way then, just how much of a boost did I get above the stock settings? I mean, I've been led to expect a massive difference by the fanboys, but I hadn't seen a whole lot of evidence to convince me of this. Well, you can colour me impressed. The delta between stock and tweaked configurations in the synthetic benchmarks was frankly hard to believe. Time Spy saw over 1100 more points in the graphics test, and Firestrike scored over 4000 points higher. That's about 17.5 and 21% increases respectively. Fortnite gained about 20% at high settings, as did Rainbow Six Extraction. <laughs> Holy shit, right? Well, not so fast. In some other games, that translated to a substantially smaller increase. Forza Horizon 5 only gains about 3 FPS from the Undervolt, Halo Infinite between 2 and 5 depending on quality settings, and Cyberpunk again sees an extra 5 FPS or so. As impressive as the gains can be, they aren't always universally incredible. So far then, the Radeon Vega 56 is the best price to performance card I've tested in 2022, on one condition, the Undervolt. Without it, you're getting roughly equal value to a slower but cheaper GTX 1070, but with dramatically higher power costs. With the Undervolt, power usage barely changes even when overclocking. If you're willing to get your hands dirty and put the time in to undervolt the Vega 56, it's worth the effort and means that, for the first time in years, I'm actually able to recommend it for gaming. If, on the other hand, you don't feel confident playing with voltages and stock speeds, the recommendation is less enthusiastic. It's just a shame these cards left the factory with such conservative settings, as many Vegas will never reach their true potential. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.